I will talk about elastography and other techniques that uh, we have at this time and we are using it clinically. Um, I'll talk about what liver stiffness is and what liver elastography means to us today. And um, it's very important to understand the basics and nuances in interpreting the data and using this technology. Um, that helps us to use it, uh, at it opti uh, optimize its use for our clinical and uh, biomarker needs. We'll talk a little bit terminology, liver stiffness, how do we come up with optimal cutoffs, and uh, controlled attenuation parameter, the role of combined LSM and CAP in the management of NAFLD NASH, other techniques of elastography and optimal strategies for use as biomarkers. It's very important to re recognize that uh, liver is inside a capsule, glycens capsule, and um, the stiffness is higher in the superficial, and as it goes low, uh, deeper into the liver, the stiffness is decreased. And with fibrosis, the stiffness increases. So as you see, um, tissue stiffness increases with increasing fibrosis. And for all practical purposes, we think that liver stiffness is uh, representative of fibrosis. But as Claude pointed out, there are many other things that can increase the liver stiffness. And this is very well shown in various studies, inflammation as in ac acute hepatitis, biliary pressure as in PSC, cholidocolithiasis can increase the liver stiffness, portal blood flow can increase the liver stiffness. And we started off with two hour uh, fasting prior to performing a transient elastogram. Um, now it's three hours with NASH CRN. We are doing overnight fasting. In clinical trials, we are doing overnight fasting. So when you're looking at the data, some may have been done without fasting. Some earlier studies were done without fasting, and more recent studies are done with possibly overnight fasting, but at a minimum three-hour fasting. And um, heart failure increases sinusoidal pressure. That can increase liver stiffness. Uh, one of the recent publications was atrial fibrillation by itself can increase liver stiffness, and so many NAFLD patients have atrial fibrillation, and right now we are not even uh, thinking about it when we are using this liver stiffness. So it's very important to understand what stiffness means before uh, we start using. And uh, for NAFLD itself, there is fibrosis and inflammation that is contributing to stiffness. Currently, we call it unreliable if ALT is um, more than 100. So when is it reliable? Is, is it when ALT is less than 100 or less than 80? There is expert opinion. Uh, I use 100, but somebody else may be using 80 units per liter as unreliable. So, um, so liver elastography is basically an imaging technique where you measure liver stiffness. And it's used by, uh, based on Young's modulus when uh, shear wave is going through the liver. In normal liver, it is slow. In a liver which has a lot of fibrosis that is stiff, the shear wave is fast. And you measure the speed, and you convert into um, elastins based on this equation. Current approaches, um, basically, liver elastography is um, it helps to understand based on three different uh, categories, based on the excitation source, as you saw in Claude's uh, amazing animation. Um, you can create a shear wave by mechanical pressure by surface of the body, or you can create a pressure by inducing a pressure wave uh, ultrasound inside the liver or you can use physiologic motion. And imaging modalities, you can have ultrasound or magnetic resonance. And the property displayed, uh, you can have transient elastography, or you can have harmonic elastography, as was seen in the MRI, where you're continuously sending the waves. Or you can do point uh, shear wave elastography or 2D shear wave. So there are many, many um, ways of measuring elastography. So each one uses their own proprietary or frequency at which they generate the shear wave. Um, so just because you have uh, elastins from uh, this in kilopascals, you cannot jump between different technologies. Uh, so you have to stick to the same technology when you are comparing the liver stiffness. So here I have categorized uh, them in different ways. So 
We have what we use at bedside in the clinics right now, vibration control, transient elastography, which is the external way we create the excitation. It's transient and it uses ultrasound, it is quantitative. Now, we do MR, which is external, harmonic, MR, and quantitative. And then you have the ultrasound base, which is internal, ultrasound, and quantitative. So you have, you have much better clarity once you organize these different technologies that we have. So we'll talk a little bit about ultrasound-based shear wave imaging. Um, this is a vibration control transient elastography. Because it is using A-mode imaging, you don't need to be a radiologist. Anybody can do this test at, uh, in the clinic. We have a medical assistant who's trained and she does this uh, test in the clinic. Basically, you're creating a shear wave and uh, as it is passing through the liver, you're using an ultrasound to measure. And it's transient because it's one time. And you measure 10 times and you get the median measurement. You have a medium probe and you have an extra large probe. Uh, here you have skin to liver capsule distance uh, because um, um, in NAFLD patients, the body habitus puts you at uh, increased skin to liver capsule distance, so you have the extra large probe. This is the amount of liver tissue that is uh, uh, interrogated using this technology. It's approximately 100 times more than the liver biopsy core. And for medium probe, the liver capsule distance is typically less than uh, 25 millimeters. And here you have 25 to 35. Your elastography correlates best with histology when it is between two to five centimeters under the liver capsule. So um, if you are not consistently hitting the same space, you will see variability. Uh, these are some studies that uh, looking at uh, histology and uh, liver stiffness comparison. Uh, this is the kilopascals um, on y-axis. And as you keep seeing again and again, there is, um, there is nice gradation, but at the same time, there is a lot of overlap. And there's been frustration with regard to this overlap, but I don't think the fault is with the technology. The fault is how we understand the technology and what ha things are happening in the liver that it is representing. It is possible that in this group, you could include some patients with high ALT, and these are th those guys are gonna show up here, and uh, some people here with fibrosis, but low ALT, they may show up here. So, um, just understanding the background helps us understand why there is so much overlap. Here, I compiled all the studies that have uh, reported a correlation between liver stiffness using vibration control transient elastography. And um, as you see, most of the earlier studies are with medium probe. Um, it, only in 2013, I think, uh, extra large probe was approved uh, in US. So any study prior to that have only medium probe, and as I illustrated earlier, your skin to liver capsule distance is much higher in NAFLD, and they weren't even reaching the right spot. So the cutoffs you see are variable. This is the proportion of patients with F2 or greater in that particular study cohort. And you have the AUROC, you have the sensitivity, you have the specificity. And you realize, you know, people come up with uh, this uh, optimal LSM cutoff, and depending upon what their study cohort is and their sensitivity specificity that they thought was optimal. And um, here you have some recent studies which are using both medium and extra large probe. And uh, again, you are seeing uh, some variation with regard to optimal cutoff and again, sensitivity, specificity, and proportion of patients. I keep going to this proportion of patients with uh, F2 or greater because I think it introduces a uh, um, phenotype or what they call as a disease spectrum bias. The more patients you include with advanced fibrosis, your cutoff moves uh, higher. So I'll explain to you what that means. Here we have LSM cutoff for cirrhosis and number of patients, medium, extra large probe, percent with cirrhosis in that cohort. And um, here you see 
6.9 cutoff for cirrhosis, but they only had 9% cirrhotic patients. So if you prime your study cohort with any particular type of disease phenotype, it can move the optimal cutoff this way or that way, and um, people are taking cutoff from one study and trying to use in their patient population. So I'm not really sure if these cutoffs are particularly meant for certain patient population or um, for everybody in the US. So here we are. Uh, what are the cutoffs for F2 or greater or F4? Because these are the clinically significant uh, cutoffs that uh, we have to worry about. And these are the criteria for enrollment into many of the therapeutic clinical trials. And should we pick a cutoff based on the sensitivity? Should we pick a cutoff based on the specificity, 90%? Um, do these cutoffs vary depending on the distribution of NAFL, the phenotype? Um, and how do we address the spectrum bias? For hep C patient clinical trials, in the, all the initial trials were excluding cirrhotic patients and reporting very high uh, treatment response, and then the FDA intervened and said, you need to have at least 20% of the study cohort uh, as cirrhotics to, for us to understand how these treatment trials uh, response is in cirrhotic patients. So maybe that kind of thought process has to happen in the biomarker too. How, what kind of patients are you including in these um, biomarker development? So switching gears, uh, we'll talk about controlled attenuation parameter. It's basically the ultrasound attenuation rate in the liver. It's measured in decibels per meter. Range is 400, uh, 100 to 400. So in normal liver, um, there is low attenuation rate and an increased uh, fat content in the liver decreases the, increases the attenuation. So this is measured in CAP. Um, here you have comparison with uh, histology and CAP score, and it's a nice gradation with regard to degree of steatosis. There's a comparison of CAP and MR uh, spectro spectroscopy, and you, here you see grade of steatosis and then the CAP score, nice gradation. Similarly, um, um, we have categorized here and um, in general, we use 300 decibels per meter for detection of severe steatosis, and normal cutoff is around 215. There's a comparison between CAP and MRI PDFF, which uh, Claude just talked about. Again, there is a good gradation with PDFF and reasonably good gradation with CAP with, again, overlap, um, AUROC, and currently we use again 300 uh, decibels per meter as the cutoff for severe steatosis. So these are some uh, cutoffs uh, that have been uh, put forth uh, for steatosis of 2%, around 250 decibels per meter, 8%, 267, 16%, 200, uh, 299. Whether it is medium or extra large probe, they seem to hold up pretty good. This is a recent study from uh, Rohit's group. Uh, again, they compared uh, MRE and uh, transient elastography um, for LSM and PDFF versus CAP. Um, here, um, MR seems to have a differentiation in the early fibrosis, but uh, transient elastography didn't fare well. Um, and then there is good correlation with PDFF and CAP. Um, this is the ultrasound uh, uh, RFI. RFI is the acoustic radiation force impulse where you're using an ultrasound to generate uh, impulse in the liver. This is all internal, um, and um, you're uh, measuring it with either point shear wave elastography or 2D. And um, there are, as you see, there are multiple vendors, uh, multiple technologies, and each of them will have their own uh, frequency. So, um, if you get um, sorry, if you get uh, liver stiffness using this technology, it may not be same as the other technology. In the interest of time, I did not go much into different uh, technologies and their uh, studies. Uh, but um, this is a B mode imaging. It requires expertise. Um, uh, radiology radiologist or a radiology technician has to do it. So. It moves the uh, technique from the clinic into radiology suite. 
simultaneous steatosis quantification is currently lacking, but uh, it will be very soon be available. And um, encouraging data using SSI in NAFLD is available. So what have we done uh, with regard to uh, elastography? Uh, I'm part of NASH CRN, Dr. Sanyal. Um, many people are here from NASH CRN. Uh, we have uh, implemented a fibro scan in the CRN, which is eight clinical centers across the United States. And uh, we have done 1,700 exams in 992 NAFLD patients. 65% were women. This is the mean BMI waist circumference, and we used 60% of the time we used extra large probe. So all the studies that published with just medium probe, I'm not sure how much relevance they have in the United States when we are using extra large probe in 60% of the time. Our failure rate was 3.2%, and proportion of unreliable scans where there was too, um, too much variability, um, it was 2.4%. So of the 55 people that we couldn't do the fibro scan. These were the different uh, reasons, but um, the, um, it is what it is. Uh, I think it will get better with time. So some of the data that has been presented at um, um, liver meeting, uh, it's a manuscript currently under review. Here we have uh, BMI categories. As the BMI increases, of course, the percent use of extra large probe is increasing. And uh, here we have every patient had two readings performed, um, and we looked at the difference between the two readings as a reliability um, measurement. And we have a good correlation um, between first and second reading, and uh, we have 90% limits of agreement within two kilopascals in the normal maybe a little bit increased in the extreme uh, obese patients, but um, similarly with the cap. Here we looked at um, what um, factors affect um, liver stiffness, unreliable measurements, and um, here it shows basically the more they experience, the number of unreliable scans go down. So there may be a le small learning curve, but it gets better the moment um, you reach a certain threshold. Then some of the variables that were associated with unreliable um, liver stiffness scans, um, of course, BMI. Um, so this is characterizing what may affect. We also looked at relationship between probe and liver stiffness cap when we adjusted for uh, all the factors that may affect the fibrosis. We saw a mean difference of um, around one kilopascals. With extra large probe, um, you get um, around one kilopascal lower value for similar degree of fibrosis. So in a clinical trial, if a patient is losing weight and you use extra large probe at baseline and you use medium probe at the end of the study, and you need to account for this one kilopascal difference that is just based on the probe. Similarly, with the cap, um, you have a difference of 16 kilopascals, um, which is um, just the probe-related difference. Um, Shadab had a poster at Easel where they looked at the optimal cutoff for detection of cirrhosis, and um, in our NASH CRN data set, we found a cutoff of 15.5 kilopascals. We fixed the specificity at 90% and we got the AUROC of 0.9. So with our experience from NASH CRN, we found out that a failure rate of 3% uh, is uh, much lower than the previously reported failure rate of up to 20%, which they had because they only had medium probe. Um, we had excellent inter and intra operator agreement and uh, we also recognize that there may be probe-related differences with regard to how you get the LSM and CAP values. So all this data that I have presented is cross-sectional and prone to certain bias, um, but bottom line is if you want to overcome those biases, then maybe patient himself will serve as the um, control, so that would be change over time. 
it possibly will help us understand the natural history and also what happens in the placebo arm with regard to change of LSM over time. And uh, one has to be, uh, be very careful with change over time is that when there's a change in LSM, is it change related to fibrosis or is it change related to inflammation? And how do we handle that change? Um, but with CAP, it seems to be pretty clear that it is change in the hepatic fat content. But if we can link these to hard outcomes, and as Claude said, you know, these are measuring something in the liver, and we are trying to correlate with histology, but our bottom line is if we can bypass the histology and if we can improve on the outcomes, then perhaps we'll get there. So what does elastography uh, role, uh, what role does elastography play in drug development right now where, with regard to various stages of drug development? We are using uh, by transient elastography, we are using MRE with uh, PDFF, and we are using histology um, at least in 2B, 3, uh, phase 3 studies. And of course, hard outcomes are always uh, desirable. Um, whether uh, we are doing actively or from academia, um, but industry has really stepped in to help us by including these biomarkers. Um, we'll get to know the data pretty soon with regard to change over time and if they correlate with histology and ultimately that change over time may uh, predict hard outcomes. So while that is happening right now, at best, we are using them as screening enrichment tools because MRI, uh, PDFF is expensive. We have clinical trials that require minimum 15% fat, minimum 10% fat, and we can't be doing um, an MRI and then realize that there's not enough fat for the clinical trial enrollment. That's waste of effort from uh, the study nurse and uh, uh, investigator and the patient's time. So we are using uh, VCTE to screen patients to help uh, maximize our time with the MRI. So that's where we are at this time. So liver elastography can be obtained through ultrasound or MRI. Uh, simultaneous LSM and CAP is very attractive in the clinic. Um, MRI with PDFF is, seems to be much more precise and very useful for the clinical trial arena. Change over time is very important, and we are looking forward to its correlation with the hard outcomes, or at least surrogate endpoints. And the strategies to minimize confounders is very critical in a clinical trial setting. In this age of disruptive technology, where everybody is used to using some app or the other, um, really liver elastography is similar to that. I mean, liver hand palpation. The living are soft and yielding, the dead are rigid and stiff. This was from 6th century BC. And we are basically doing the same thing, but with uh, disruptive technology. So thank you for your time. <laughs>